uh, well, you see, it's called presbyopia, ladies and gentlemen. It's, you've heard of myopia. Uh, presbyopia is quite an interesting condition. It's the one that causes your arms to shorten as you get older. <laughs> and you always have to put this stupid expression in ah. It comes from the Greek word pre presbutros, which means the old man. So literally, presbyopia is the way the old man sees. It's the same root as Presbyterian. <laughs> Governance of church affairs by the old men, the elders. In my country, Scotland, uh, which is part of Great Britain, I insist that you remember, and long may it remain in this way. In, in my country, Presbyterianism is an absolutely fundamental thing. It came to a great head in Scotland's particular revolution of the 19th century. While all over Germany and in Italy too, but Germany in particular, the various states of the Palatinate, the rump remains of the Holy Roman Empire, were being forged into one Reich. Um, you know the way that, that all, in the 1840s, there were barricades in the streets of Dresden and Leipzig and great artists like Wagner had to flee for their lives. In Scotland, I'm very pleased to say that that revolution occurred entirely within the Church of Scotland. A revolution in 1843, it was called the Great Disruption. And it was possibly the greatest historical manifestation of the Presbyterian idea. This was that government of, the governance of church affairs was not to be put into the hands of the laird, that's the landowner, but put into the hands, rather, of the elders of the church. This was our Scottish drive towards democracy. Uh, we did it with not a, a drop of blood spilt. Two, uh, some 390 ministers walked out of their parish during that re revolution to form the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland. And overnight, virtually, Scotland doubled its stock of church buildings. The radical Presbyterians, of course, favoured that churches under their Presbyterian idea should be built in a sternly Grecian manner, thoroughly Doric, because, of course, this represents the Ur form of architecture. And these Presbyterians valorised the Old Testament high above the New Testament, which, of course, they loved. But the Old Testament was more like them, more Hebraic, more Judaical. You know, it's true that the Chinese, the strongest people in the world, are only interested in two groups in the world these days, the Jews and the Scots. Why is this? Well, they're both brilliant at making money, except me. And of course, they're both the, the most intelligent people in the world. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the greatest Salt Lake uh, paintings in the world. It's Holman Hunt painted it, and he sat in Judea on the edge of that salty marsh. And with a gun to uh, save himself, he actually did the studies for that work in Judea. It's called The Scapegoat. And of course, you can read it as an allegory of what's going to happen in the uh, New Testament uh, case, with the scapegoat with the sins of the world upon its shoulders and cast out is now going to prefigure the position of Jesus himself. And if you know this, well, that, that's a, something of an interest, but there's a more perceptual, more immediate way of understanding the devastating message of this picture. And it's quite simply this. As the wee girl in Glasgow would say, oh, that's a pure wee shame. In other words, the picture elicits pity. And the minute pity, or fellow feeling, mitleid, as the Germans call it, the minute that is encountered in the world, there is an absolute hammer blow struck against what religious people would call Satan, or what philosophers would call the will to live. The idea of our competition, our absolute focus on ourselves as the centre of the world, now disappearing from our hearts and being put wholeheartedly onto another creature. In this case, of course, leaping the species divide. This is a great and compelling work, a truly moral work. It's also a highly aesthetic work. But we know, of course, that Immanuel Kant, you know, the great art philosopher that started it in the 19th century, or late 18th, early 19th century, he was the one 
that said there is an explicit relationship between aesthetics and ethics. This is why we have this feeling that contemporists, I don't use the word modernists, contemporists are all such odious people. It, it's a generalisation, you understand, and badness is to be found in every field of human endeavour. But there's something else about this picture that is automatically compelling and does that hammer strike against the ego again. And it's this, that there is a distance in the picture, a distance to which you look and out of which you yourself pour into a sort of state where you're left as a kind of husk. Your will to power, as Friedrich Nietzsche would have called it, has now been drained completely out of you because you're looking far away to the distant hills, be they the hills of home or the hills of the unspeakable desert of Judea. The thing is, you will never be there. And this is what makes the contemplation of distances and great rocky landmasses such a compelling and highly moral thing. Great things happen in the context of deserts. For instance, we look to see at this other kind of desert. That's the notes gone, so we're on our own. Um, Uh, this is one of the deserts at the bottom end of this unhappy, unhappy sphere that we occupy. The camp of Robert Falcon Scott, who just about a hundred years ago went to, for no reason at all, apart from a bit of imperial tub thumping as far as I can see, it was mainly aesthetic of course, simply get to the bottom of this thing and to get there first, kind of pushy fellow, they didn't get there in the end and he left a testament well, he did get there, but he wasn't first. But he left a testament in his tent when they found it many months later with the frozen men lying in it. And in his final notes, written with a rotten hand gangrened off, he wrote, God protect our people. As it were, a premonition that two years later there was going to commence the most appalling bloodbath that gave us, as one of our speakers yesterday so brilliantly pointed out, the catastrophe of contemporism or modernism, or at least anti-traditionalism. Great things are said in these wildernesses. I wish I didn't have to do this all the time. Right, right, okay. And then at the other end of, of the globe, up here, Caspar David Friedrich, in an earlier time, in the, 18, in the early 19th century, paints this picture of a, a ship. You can just see it crashing in amongst these appalling, uh, colliding glacial masses. We think of Franklin and his gallant crew looking for that north, Northwest Passage, and the people driven in their extremes to make testaments, testaments where there is no culture, no coffee machine, very poor email reception. Left, as it were, alone without a scrap of vegetation. A great modernist of late times, T.S. Eliot, great American poet, he, he evokes this whole thing in that poem, The Wasteland, to the bottom of which none of us will ever attain. It would take a Delian diver to get to the bottom of it. And halfway between these two poles, we come across wilderness added to, you see? And this is not that far from here. This is one of the greatest objects on the face of the planet, ladies and gentlemen. It will outlive the species. So look, and, 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 it's, and despair. As Gutzon Borglum said, that he asked a geologist how much the original stone, you know, what you see here, had worn down in 6,000 years. And the geologist said, well, about that much. And so Borglum, who was a tremendous propagandist, said, you mean that since the time of Moses, the mountain has ground down the thickness of a child's finger? Now that's a man who knows about advertising. <laughs> who would have a measurement or a number when you could have the thickness of a child's finger? His point was that, of course, in a concomitant time, subsequent to the carving of this work, it will have worn down by that much. Now, of course, it will outlive the human species. And by the time the rocks melt with the sun, as Robert Burns said, and this is planet is just a red mass with a sun very close to it, well, that object will be upside down and it will be positioned somewhere near Frankfurt because of the imperatives of tectonic shift, you understand. <laughs> Nevertheless, for the time being, this, the shrine of democracy, as its proper name 
uh, is, will stand here to remind us of what it will be like when we are gone. We, uh, all of us are gone. That collected, uh, as it were, reservoir of ego and will. You might be interested to know, ladies and gentlemen, that the sculptor of this work, Gutzon Borglum, was brought up in a Mormon household in Utah. How about that, you see? An instantaneous appreciation of the charms and compelling mysticism of the desert. The desert. You know, Egypt, of course, wins every day because, well, one reason is that nobody understands anything about the Egyptians. I mean, it's a complete no-hoper. What, what, what a strange life-obsessed people. They weren't death-obsessed, you understand. They were life-obsessed. That's what all that mummification is about. They're one of the most vitalist peoples that ever was in that strange little valley in the north of Africa. And we remember in popular history that deserts like this are existentially challenging. So that the recently expired uh, Peter O'Toole, as, um, as Noel Coward said, had he been any prettier, it would have to be called Florence of Arabia. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the star, star lineup, it is eye candy, you've got to admit. <laughs> but, you know, Lawrence's testimony, there is a man that was driven to the edge of insanity after the desert experience. At the end of it, when, well, no, when he took Aqaba, Abu, uh, Auda Abu Tai, who was the chief of the habitat, uh, was very disappointed that there was no money in Aqaba. Well, they had paper money, but that's of no interest to a man like Auda. And so Lawrence, because the telegraph had been cut, had to take the message of the taking of Aqaba, whose guns could not turn round landward. They took it from the desert. And he had to go across the Sinai Desert personally to deliver it, the news of the taking of Aqaba to his chiefs back in Cairo. And he had to cross the Sinai Desert with two young boys who were in his, uh, you know, in his service. He's, and Auda said to him, you have to cross the Sinai Desert. You shall never do it. And Lawrence said to him, Moses did. Blasphemer, said Auda. And what about, and are you going to take those children too? And Lawrence said, Moses did. And he got there, across that appalling wasteland, Sinai Desert. He didn't pass this mountain, which of course is Mount Sinai. It's not much of a mountain really, it's more like an outcrop. If it had been bigger, it wouldn't have had the same kind of power. This is how Mount Rushmore works. It's a small mountain, really just a bluff. It's big enough for us to see and encompass in a way. It was from this mountain that Moses descended, of course, and brought us one of the most compelling and devastating desert-born, desert-engendered anxieties or crises. He comes down from the mountain with the tablets, and in this drawing by Gustave Doré, the rays coming out of his head. I'm just thinking after yesterday's presentations, the idea of those compasses, that is not quite the rays we expect, is it? There's something very, very interesting about that. Not quite entirely satisfactory. Of course, in the old days, we thought that Moses came down from the mountain with horns on his head. Hence, in the most famous representation of Moses by Michelangelo Buonarroti, Di Simone, full name, just for you, um, you can see that two horns sing out of his forehead there. Now, this has been a great embarrassment for um, scriptural redactors, and it's been put down to a redactive error, that the Hebrew word for rays and the Hebrew word for horns are somehow alike in some way. Michelangelo's testimony, for all I have misgivings about him, is something that would stop me looking at this question of the horns of Moses. And I think we have a clue here to the actual source of the gigantic problem that we have in the West, in the Occident, with our anxiety about image making. 
Now, let's have a look at this. You see, here, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. That's Michelangelo's account. And this is an account of Moses by the Dijon sculptor Klaus Schluter. Moses there in the middle. It's part around a, a pulpit. Now, you see, what happens is, as you know, you know the old story, that Moses comes down from the mountain and there are various, uh, well, he's got a copy of the brief on him. It's a fairly restrictive brief, especially if you're a maker of images. And you see that the second one, as a matter of urgency, insists that thou shalt make unto thee no graven image. And all the other recommendations are actually rather good. But this one, I, personally, I take exception to. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I just try my best, and I hope not to hurt people. I mean, one statue pays 121 men and women. You know, it can't be that big a sin. Or perhaps, after all, is it? But a sin against what? Possibly a sin against nature itself. You know, we've had a very nice and pleasant conference, but I'm going to get catastrophic now. You know, it's just my romantic nature. And then when you look closely at Schluter's astounding account of this great figure, this force of nature, some of us would go as far as to say this avatar of Jehovah himself, then we see exactly why we must be very attentive to this figure the most fundamental figure in the history of the art of the Western world. It's a brilliant image. It's kept rather under wraps. And see how he understands the kind of horns to put on him. So much better than Michelangelo's poor account, really. Wait a minute. Imagine that. Talk about heresy. But you see, it's, it's right enough. The head of, my, of, of Moses is, is not really convincing. And the horns go off at wrong angles. It's not right. Whereas Schluter gives a stupendous psychological account of this fundamental figure. Do you know the story? The poor children of Israel are being dragged by Moses out of Egypt. He's a kind of living embodiment of the desire always to move on, perpetual mobile, always going, always striving. It's a dialectical deity that he is. He's a god of the thesis opposed by the antithesis, um, warring together to form the synthesis, which will now rise as a new thesis to be opposed by another antithesis. And in the war, a new synthesis will arise, which becomes the new thesis against... It goes on and on. It's actually the political model of perpetual revolution. It's known as the Hegelian triad because that monstrous, monstrous philosopher of the early 19th century, Hegel, who gave us both Stalin and Hitler. And what a neat trick. Uh, he was the one, he was the one who set Marx up to say, nothing happens without the dialectic. Why did not he just put a sock in it and take a Trappist vow? <laughs> the poor children of Israel dragged through the desert in this perpetual mobile. You know, Moses can never be allowed to see the promised land. He has to die before it because this will cause Moses to have to settle and Moses is not a settler. You see, it's very, very interesting this. And Moses goes up the mountain and the poor wee children of Israel think, a bit of a breather here. So the first thing they do is they build. Well, they put down a foundation first and they build a little piece of architecture they have symbolically stopped and then they gather around in a circle, very important, and worship or maybe just simply admire a little piece of sculpture that they've put on top of it. In the great story of Exodus, the wandering through the deserts, this is a moment of stasis, as it were a still eddy on the general driving Missouri of the rest of the story. Moses comes down off the hill in tremendous fury with his tablets. He smashes them, goes back up, back down with new ones, and then gets his Levites to round up the poor people who have breached the second law. 3,000 men, women, and children forces them to grind down the molten calf. It's not the golden calf. It's the molten calf. 
grind it, grind it down into a kind of soup of which they all must partake, and they are put to death. Put to death in direct breach of the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. This proves to me that sculpture is worse than murder. <laughs> because priorities count in a kind of thing like that. I have an insight, ladies and gentlemen, that I haven't dared say. I'm very worried because we're in a seismic area just now, but I'm just going to say it anyway. The horns make perfect sense to me, not, not the rays. Because if you think about it from the contemporary art point of view, what is your average orthodox contemporary art school like? They like a sketchbook full of no drawings, but full of lots of pretentious written texts. Right? They like that text. Here we have, and I think Poussin's account is rather better here, we have an account really of that fundamental thing where text opposes image. This is what we've got now established in the modernist sen sensibility or the contemporary sensibility, that if you've got a choice between a text and a choice between an image, the text will win every time. Here, back in ancient Hebrew mythology, and by the way, when I say mythology, I don't mean that which is untrue, I mean that which is absolutely fundamentally a distillation of the greatest truths on earth, that we have in Hebrew mythology the opposition of the text to the image and the represented thing to the real thing. You know how in the 20th century, the last century, as I love to call it, that we have the growth of the objet trouvé, you know, the found object in official contemporary art. What's happening here is that Moses comes down with his real horns, found object horns, to oppose the horns that are depicted on, on the calf. This, to me, is my reading of it. I mean, I'm a bit of a mythographer myself. You know, all we can do is try to interpret, and I think this makes this story tremendously powerful. It's a devastating story, and a mosaic iconophobia has continued right through the history of the world. This is why artists are traditionally struggling, struggling people. You know, nobody ever heard of a struggling butcher, or a struggling accountant, or a struggling tax collector. Iconophobia has continued right into our present times. Here's an explosion in the desert. It's in the north of Afghanistan, and it shows the eradication of a piece of sculpture. There it is. That's what it looked like. A little figure of the or gigantic figure of the Buddha, again set into this deserty kind of landscape, and it's about 600 years old. A series of attacks obviously occurred within this, what the top part of the head has been destroyed manually, but now we've got the technology, we can just do away with it in one fell swoop, can't we? And of course, it was done away with by uh, the Taliban, or what used to be called the Mujahideen in a previous uh, manifestation. Here's another little Buddha further along that rock, and it too suffered the same fate. This is in our time, ladies and gentlemen. There's the fellow, the author of this work, well, presumably, or a uh, symbolic author of this work, jumped up and triumphant. What has he really done, this awful little vitalist? What he's done is he's done away with an object that represents the still, the not moving, the perpetual, the unmovable. In this respect, he accords with so many of the vitalist imperatives that motivate us today in so many ways. For instance, the triumph of the film industry. You know, if people say, Sandy, that's me, right? Sandy's uh, starring alongside uh, Matt Damon in the next Bourne conspiracy in Hollywood. He must have made it. Oh, he's really made it. He's made it big. Conversely, if somebody says, see Matt Damon, he's actually gone to Paisley in Scotland to work with Sandy. Everybody would say, what's happened to Matt? Is he having a nervous breakdown or something? This is because you see, in the first case, Sandy has gone to the movies. But in the second case, Matt has gone to the stillies. And the still associates with what? The dead. As Aristotle said, all signs of life are established fundamentally in movement. If somebody's lying on the floor, you rush up to see if you can see the slightest movement, the slightest elevation, and then you know he's alive and you breathe a sigh of relief. This is one of the fundamental problems of sculpture 
that it is so still and people try to animate sculpture as it were a talisman against this strange silent image that won't clap, won't group hug and there's no chance of a high five. <laughs> they were lovely things. I think there's an effort to try to rebuild them but it's impossible because these things are carved out of the live rock, so to speak. Well, have a look at it and see how the drapery descends. You see the lovely, calm quality of the stance. 1960s photograph this. Something nice and beautiful, serene above all. The Buddha established 600 years before BC. And looking at this, Look at this. You see the similarities that abide there. That strange descending quality. Absolute peace and serenity. You know this work, of course, because it's a central image in the Church of the Latter-day Saints. You know, there's a copy of it way out here in this mighty territory so far from its home. Next time you see the work, watch what its, set, its central movement is. It doesn't go this way or that way, and it certainly doesn't go forward. Rather, it proceeds backward in an action like this. The inscription at the front in Danish, Kommer til mig, means come to me. But it should, strictly speaking, be translated to come with me into this great golden apse. The other world, leave the worldly behind. And because the work induces people to leave the world behind in its purity, its chastity, its never-ending qualities. Many people are highly incensed by it. In the 1960s, a modernist artist said that we should all descend on the church of Verfluer Kirche in Copenhagen, where this work stands, and smash Torvaldsen's Christ to pieces. It so fundamentally went against all the ethos of that radical, forward-looking and highly myopic modernismus that's given us the misery that we have. This is the Church of the Vorfruer Kirche, the Church of Our Lady, Vorfruer Kirche. It's by C.F. Hansen, the great Danish neoclassicist, odious man, but that's nothing to do with it. His building is beautiful, a fantastic desert in itself of a building. That gorgeous, stripped Scandinavian um, classicism. Here's a long section for you. Uh, beautiful drawing, of course. And you can see how the work works within this mighty hall. You see, there's the Christ and its edicule there. And then the 12 apostles, well, 11 apostles, and St. Paul goes to stand in for Judas. I think that's a failure myself, but nevertheless, it's a brilliant scheme of work. And it's along there. Um, and we, it's very hard to get decent photographs of the interior because modern photographs are also terrible. But here's an old postcard that shows you just exactly how the original work stands to this day in the Vorfruerkirche in Copenhagen, the big cathedral church of Copenhagen. It's a Lutheran building. Come to me, and communion is served right up at the table so that the statue with its gesture is seen to be, as it were, um, in, in, in taking part. Torvaldsen, for me, is my great hero. He turned me from my vitalist youth, my obsession with Rodin, you know, the, you know, the late 19th, uh, 20th century sculptor. And actually it taught me, first of all, what the virtues of stillness and sculpture were. I was still a radical and challenging young man at the time, and it was a tremendous struggle to actually give up like this and take part, as it were, to take this sacrament of stillness and whiteness and purity and, above all, chastity. Rodin was so full of sex and abundance Whereas Torvaldsen, by his detractors, is always accused of being somehow, well, puritanical. There's nothing more puritanical than a contemporist, I can tell you. Torvaldsen was an extraordinarily good-looking man. Uh, here, here he's seen uh, in his young, uh, well, his, his first flowering with the great uh, Alexander Fries behind him. He's got a, a cross of honour, a papal knighthood that's been given to him there. He's suffering nicotine addiction at this time. Um, and then he grows out of that and he, he enters into uh, full, mature uh, solidity and uh, puts on a bit of weight. Uh, 
And now, now for something really strange, ladies and gentlemen, we see that Torvaldsen, who died in 1844, he died the most famous artist in the world. Walter Scott was dead. Canova was dead by 22 years. Wagner had not yet arrived. Torvaldsen was the most famous artist in the world. And so the inventors of the daguerreotype rushed to Copenhagen to find him in his retirement and took a photograph of the sculptor, of the great Christus that stands out here in the extreme west. And here's a photograph of the old man brought home to Copenhagen by royal command from Rome because it is absolutely important to the Danes under political stress at this time that their national hero, the Danes have as their national hero, a sculptor, that he die on Danish soil. But what's interesting about this picture is the way Torvaldsen's holding his hand. He's lived in Italy for a long, long time. He's afraid of the camera, aren't we all? As he seems to know that the invention of this thing will be the death of modern art and turn people into maniacs and pornographers. He seems to know that there's a way of saving himself from this using an old gesture, the old prophylactic horns that you show if you're afraid of anything. And that's what he's doing there. People have studied that photograph and they can't, it's such an awkward gesture to have your hand in. And after all, remember that Torvaldsen is used to have a, making a portrait by means of sitting somebody down beside him with a stick and a ball of clay in it. The person sitting there, he's standing here. The three of them are in this strange, questing desire to try to make an image of this. And it's done at the end, not perfectly correctly. You know, it's a good enough likeness, but it's not perfect. That the reception requires some degree of indulgence. Yes, and also the intervention of that thing called art or style. Whereas here comes a man with a tripod with a box in it, with a tray with some Mephistophelian material on it. He's to sit entirely still, or stand still, and then the man puts a hood over his head. How sinister can this get? And then suddenly, poof! And then he goes away at the chemist and comes back with this appallingly lifelike image of him. He feels his soul, soul has been stolen. And in some respects, of course it has. Remember that for Torvaldsen, he, unlike us, has never heard the word camera. You know, he doesn't know it's a camera, but the chap says, this is my camera. Questo è mio camera. And what does camera mean in Italian? Room. He's going to take a picture of me with his room, as in chamber, you know. I mean, it's a terrifying thought. Now, Torvaldsen had a great museum built for him, for all his collections. He that sits in the centre of Copenhagen, nestling next to the Royal Palace. Now, the modernists, of course, seeing a beautiful thing like this, they can't actually take their bazooka and blow it to kingdom come, but they can include this jazzy thing, water feature, I think you call it, <laughs> on the front. And, and, uh, and although it's their heart's desire to destroy the building, at least they can destroy the reflection. You see how they go? They just score it out. <laughs> you see? And this is the equivalent, really, to skateboarding with joy in front of the empty alcove in Bamayan. In the old days when... Can you all still hear me, by the way? Yeah. In the old days when peace and tranquility reigned, the Torvalsons Museum looked like this with this lovely canal, still operative at that time, built by Bindisbol, a great Danish architect, unknown to so many. It borrows the dome of C.F. Hansen's church behind it. It looks like the one thing. It's a beautiful composition. And it was there that I turned. I turned from being a young uh, contemporist and egotist into being somebody that was actually devoted not to doing my work, but to doing the work, making some pathetic contribution to the titanic rainbow just at the end quite far nevertheless from the treasure it, it was a non critical thing and in that that building that you just saw there is the plaster original from which um Bien -Ame, an assistant of Torvaldsen cut the first marble for Vorfrua Kirchen there it stands in that material that material that has no kudos plaster it's a real dalit and untouchable of a material people say to me do you work in bronze I say, no, I work in clay. So they walk away from me. 
because clay is soft, feminine, and uh, quiet. Whereas if they're saying work in bronze, then they think, well, he's pouring metal. He's like with the Nibelungen, you know, in, in hell. We like him. Or if he's a carver, he's got a hammer and a chisel and he's stripped to the waist, making sure, obviously, that somebody's watching, and hammering in <laughs> like a hero. And you must go and see this because, you know, this is part of your great heritage here. And then you'll see the whole composition in this tight room that Bindisbal built, the Christ Hall, it's called. And there you see these figures in plaster, this low material, all compacted together in this tight with this bull's blood on the stucco. Beautiful uh, Greek revival work. And it was here, really at the foot of it, that I turned my life round. Even a sanctuary like that is subject to traducing. So a work like this, this is one of Torvalds' works that you can see in there. The Danish Academy, of course, you know, the Academy, full of deconstructors and cultural psychopaths, uh, requests that one of their star students Star students should be allowed in to, as it were, minimal interventions on the works of Torvaldsen to bring them to life so that their cold, dead, unappealing qualities can be, as it were, eradicated. So this is actually done against the statutes of the Torvaldsen Museum in which nothing should change. It's the Taliban all over again, the idea of doing away with the image. In Denmark, unhappy country as it is, this happened to The Little Mermaid. It was done in the 1960s by another contemporist artist who did it, he said, as a protest against bad official art. The Danish police, who to a man resisted the Nazi occupation in, Copenhagen, in Denmark generally, to a man, they were virtually wiped out because they would not collaborate. Greatest police force in the world. When this happened in the 1960s, that same police force put the murder squad on the case. They got him, but he pleaded artistic interventionism and got away with it. I would have guillotined him and called it an artwork. <laughs> or at least art criticism. And this spreads all over the world. Glasgow, my fatal city, you know, it's just up the road from here I live, has got the statue of the Duke of Wellington by Baron Carlo Marachetti. He did sculpture for the Art de Triomphe and that stupendous altarpiece in the Church of the Madeleine in Paris, you know, with the Madeleine rising up with the angel. He did this. And Glasgow has got one of his works. But what do the Glaswegian municipality authorities insist upon? That a traffic cone is actually instituted as being on top of the head of the man who liked Hitler. Well, it was Napoleon, but it's the same old stuff. And we do this and we celebrate it as a great way of showing that Glasgow can make fun of itself. But all it is, of course, is resentment politics. Terrible, terrible times. And then in the same city, when Honeyman bought this work, one of the greatest, most transcendental images of Christ that was ever done, Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross, when this went up, a moron went and ripped it to pieces just for the same kind of thing because of its symmetry, because of its beauty, and because although the cross is flying, it doesn't look as though it's going anywhere. The simplicity of it. And then it's the same old iconophobic instinct that makes the Michelangelo's early Pieta get busted in the nose and the arm there. Somebody, the will to live, the devil, the Philistine imperative within him, has to take a hammer to it. Wait a minute, it's everywhere. This is the last Pieta, the Rondanini Pieta, that Michelangelo did in his tremendous old age. It's a funny looking object. See what's happened. He's cut the sculpture and brought it to some degree of finish. And then he's decided that he doesn't like it anymore, so he's decided to bust back and recut the figure of the Christ, as it were, being supported by the Virgin behind. You see, and he's, you can see the evidence of the previous manifestation in that arm that hangs out there in midair. Michelangelo has made very sure to leave that beautifully finished arm visible to us, to prove that he too has indulged in the joy of destruction. Michelangelo had a terribly, terribly bad character, as you can tell just by looking from at him. <laughs> he and Vasari involved themselves in a terrible, mischievous plot 
to establish Michelangelo as Il Divino, a monument in his own mind, in his own time. But this has gone on right from the very word go. I hope my time's all right. Is it okay? Is it okay? Um, um, this has gone on from the word go. You see, this is the first work of Western sculpture in a way. It's by the Athenian sculptor called Critias. It's called the Critian Boy. It's found in the rubble of the Acropolis in Athens. You see, hitherto, they tried to make figures. And they made them like this. And then they thought, well, it's a bit boring. You see, you know these kuroi, you know the very primitive standing Greek figures before the high classical period. So the figures stood like this. And then they think, well, it's a bit boring, so we'll put a smile on it. It looks stupid. <laughs> because, you know, a smile is an evanescent thing, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you smile, and then you go away. You return to your natural, miserable look. If you're smiling all the time, you're the village idiot. You see? That's why statues should never really smile. You know, imagine that, smiling away. 2.30 <laughs> in a February morning in Edinburgh. <laughs> Not good. We put a smile on it, and they got fed up with that, and then thought, right, we'll, we'll, go, we'll do this. That's him moving now, but it's not, it's not good. Still not good. So they think, right, well, in order to make him move, we'll do this, and they'll go this. And it was terrible. It's like Rodin's walking man, that bad. And then Critias came along and said, you stupid Greeks. Just look at the world. Prosecute the world with your eye. Don't get conceptual about this. Get perceptual about this. And don't think of forward going. Think of a movement that involves no movement. Oh, they're completely lost, of course, in the studio where this work was done. And so Critios then said, it's like this. You see? Or supporting leg and a playing leg. There we have the movement without going forward or backward, going nowhere. You see? This is the great thing about the discovery of this work. Pure voodoo, right? You could stick pins in that and the whole human race would die. <laughs> Tremendous anxiety in the studio when this work was done. And how do we know this? It's because the damage to the head is contemporaneous with the work itself. It was busted in antiquity. And the great at Fort Vangler and all these great uh, connoisseurs of antique sculpture Reckon it is the same hand that cut the replacement as cut the rest of the figure. Somebody's taken a mallet to it in the studio for fear of what it's doing. What is it doing? It's representing the world. And the world, like any animal, doesn't like to be looked at. Look, I take anybody in the audience. Now, this is not against you particularly, but I'm going to look at you. You don't like it, do you? And when we're speaking to people, we dodge our eyes about all the time. We don't we're never actually looking at them. Nature, as Heraclitus said, 600 or 500 BC, nature loves to hide. But the artist's job, the representational artist's job, is to prosecute nature with his eyes and see to her very core. This is why it's so difficult to make busts of imperial people who wish an empire for themselves upon which the sun will never set. But nice, kind, little people, modest, are very happy to sit because they don't care who looks at them. The work was destroyed in antiquity because it was spooky. And this spookiness continues to affect people to this day. This is me posing like blazes in my studio in Paisley. Uh, folk often say to me, are you not frightened to be working in here alone at night with all these figures? They might all come to life. They really want them to come to life. What terrifies them is the fact that these things never move a muscle. One or two sculptures, ladies and gentlemen. This is a figure that I did some time ago of St. Nicholas of Tolentino for a chapel, a private chapel in the borders of Scotland. It just shows the full miserere with a kind of Italian or Baroque quality to it. This, the corresponding one is a statue of St. Augustine of Hippo. And you can see I've gone for the full hyper papery here. I mean, I was brought up a Baptist. Uh, you know, very, very closed, like the brethren. No drink, no playing cards in the house. You can't play on your bike on a Sunday. You can't go to the cinema. On Sunday, you can read the Pilgrim's Progress or take a walk up the Newton Hill, which is a sort of slight incline. <laughs> in, 
in Wick, in the very north of Scotland, where my mother's parents come from, they were extremely uh, Sabbatarian. I'm a great believer in Sabbatarianism, but it was very poor. And one day when I was about eight or nine or something, I thought, I just can stand this Sunday afternoon no longer. So I went through to the parlour where there was an old piano, and I sat down, and I thought, right, I'm going to play a wee Bach two-part invention, something very modest. I was learning at the time. So I started to play this Bach, you know. My grandfather came thundering through and said, Oh, Sandy, then I'd be playing on ragtime on the Sabbath. <laughs> this is how bad it was. He was a fine man, kind and decent man, the finest man I ever knew, actually. So I wonder what they'd think of me now. And then a little sculpture like this in a very different manner. We must remember that the word classical is used too easily these days. Classical sculpture. What do we mean by that? Do we mean traditional or do we mean, do we mean simply realist? Or do we mean simply somehow accomplished or recognisable? Classicism is a specific term. For instance, there's a thing called neoclassicism. How do the two differ? And then there's Florentine classicism, which is another thing again. And then there's neo-neoclassicism, which you find, for instance, in the Rockefeller Center, a sort of deco number. There's all sorts of classicisms that work. This is a figure of Coyla in the clay model, the absolute verbatim account. She's the muse of Robert Burns, the poet. And then work like this, which is much more in the style of a neo-Renaissance manner. Adolf von Hildebrandt, who died in 1921, is really the sort of governing figure behind this study, one of the Stations of the Cross. And then back to a really very Torvaldsonian neoclassicism. I've worked all my life with architects, or the co company of architects. I haven't worked with as many architects as I want to. Uh, and I understand that, you see, in architecture, you have to be an eclecticist. Many, many styles are absolutely in your command. Playfair can, can do Doric. He can do Ionic. He can do Jacobean. He can do Gothic. He can do any style you really want, apart from the style of Zaha Hadid. Uh, who would want to do that? This is a figure of Ganymede. It's uh, cut in marble. But the clay models are the absolute key verbatim account. This is the thing. All the work is done in clay, and as for bronze, it's just another rubbishy synthetic material. Uh, yes, it is synthetic, you see, but because you can actually say bronze, everybody thinks it's somehow an argument. <laughs> People actually say about the rubbish sculptures, it'll be better when it's cast in the bronze. You see, what's happening there is they're being invited to, like bats to see with their ears. They've heard the word bronze, they think, oh, it must be good. Bronze, bronze, bronze. Seeing with their ears the word coming in, which is a handmaiden of the concept, to replace the perceptual deficit. This is a figure of history. Uh, that's the clay model. You can see that she's got a Beaux-Arts type to her, French Beaux-Arts manner. What does she remind you of a bit? Statue of Liberty, the greatest Beaux-Arts statue in the world, and one of the very few works that is perfect from all angles. Never forget, it is a work of art, not a work of advertising. That work went up on the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, to replace a statue that had been taken down because it was weathering. And we cast it in aluminium, what we call aluminium. You call it aluminium. And you call it aluminium. A whole lot of modernists jumped in this. You know, Scotland's absolutely crawling with them. And they said, oh, Sandy Stoddart's gone over to the modernist side because he's using aluminium. Right? And why do they think of aluminium as being some sort of modernist material? Is it because it ends in the word eum? Therefore, it sounds scientific and space age, you know? That sort of 50 shades of grey dystopia that we all suffer this from here to Dubai. I mean, it's all muck, all materials rubbish. I mean, you think of my great friend here, Alex Cresswell, right? Alex, right. Now, what are you made of? Well, you're made of fluids. You know, some bits of bone, some other liquors, some, some hair, some gristle. That's what you're made of, but if we said, this is what Alex is, well, I think we should all rise up and say this is an absolute outrage. Alex Cresswell is Alex Cresswell despite all these materials. These materials are evanescent, but there's something about Alice, Alex that carries on, you see? And what's that called? Well, soul, our spirit, our goodness, or whatever the thing is that, that we think, distinct from the clay or the muck, the rubbish that we all are made of. Now I'm making a work for Dallas in Texas. This is a monument, a huge decorative column. 
This is a small study for it. There's another one there beside it. It's an Adam Smith monument. Adam Smith sits in the Ross, stands in the rostrum at the front. There'll be Jefferson at the next one, and Madison for the Constitution at the back, John Locke, a figure of Eos at the top, goddess of the dawn. It's a Beaux-Arts kind of thing. It's not a column, ladies and gentlemen. Understand and indulge me. It's a sculpture of a column. It'll be cast in bronze, top to bottom, and weigh about 12 tons. And then uh, done other things like this, that, this bust of Pope John Paul II. Uh, so I've, I've really, as it were, drifted from the Presbyterian imperative of my childhood and gone right to the heart of um, the Vatican. Now, I can't, I'm finishing off now with, with an image of the polar opposite to the papacy, which is, of course, the great Reform, Reformation hero of the Scots, John Knox. You know, he was there for forging that Reformation and destroying St Andrew's Cathedral because it was covered in sculpture. Nothing like smashing a piece of sculpture. Nowadays, of course, they, on the principle that prevention is better than cure, they have a much more prophylactic view to it and they try to prevent it at the art schools from happening. Now, I want you to... This is a great work by Hutchison, a Scottish sculptor of the 19th century. It's a superb piece of tight workmanship. But I want you to concentrate on the hat of, of John Knox, the great scourge of all us iconophiles, because he's, his hat is very similar to the hat of the Taliban. Let, let just, let's just look at this, right? Hat. Hat. I'll do it again. Hat. Hat. See, two layers. So I think we should be told. I think we should be told. Now, if you come to Edinburgh, as I hope you all will, uh, which is the capital city of Scotland, then we can go and visit this thing. This is John Knox's house. <laughs> I was sure I say his compound <laughs> in, in the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. And this traditionally it was owned by him. And this had a very important impact on my early career. Because on the corner of that church, of that small building, is this image of Moses. You see, he's waiting on Mount Sinai, and there's God written in English, Latin, and Hebrew. Oh, no, Greek, sorry, Greek. Gosh, it's a cretinous detail, that. Imagine writing that down, you know, as, as though you shouldn't know. And there's this tablet, and you see it's waiting to be written on by the divine hand. Well, if you walk up the Royal Mile, uphill, you'll go past, incidentally, and one, of, one of my works that stands there, the statue of Adam Smith. It's a great walk, this. Um, uh, you'll come to... You'll come to uh, well, just have a look at that. It sees that... America really paid for this. Mrs. Thatcher wrote a letter to America saying, cough up. <laughs> and they did. Vast amounts more. So there are tremendous benefits for everybody. But you'll go further up and you'll see my statue of David Hume, the philosopher, the great enlightened Scottish philosopher, patron saint of atheists. Um, and <clears throat> this was the... Uh, Good man. <laughs> you see? I'm just talking dirty for you. Uh, uh, and this was made when I was very, very young. And, of course, it was put in the antique because we have to make sure that the issues or questions that David Hume is wrestling with aren't, as it were, um, to do with your time. They're to do with all time. So, therefore, he takes his trousers off. He takes his jabot off. He takes everything off that's all sartorial and trivial and gets draped in a shock of drapery. I did this on the advice of the great German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who said, a great man is to be your stature, then show him naked, or at least with a shock of drapery over his shoulder. I followed Schopenhauer's advice, and I've been following it ever since. You see the statue of Hume, the atheist, in front of the centre of the Church of Scotland, in Scotland, St Giles Cathedral there. So that really shows you what Scotland is, as it were, uh, an uncontrollably secularising uh, country. Because, of course, Re Reformationism is a secularising movement. Secularism is a religious expression. It means basically the throwing open of the church. But you see how David Hume's tablet, coming from the tablet that, that uh, Moses is holding further down the road, is uninscribed. Because in the Enlightenment, Hume, our Moses, has gone up Mount Sinai and said, and God has said to him, David, I don't exist. 
and the tablet has come back down empty. The problem with this is, ladies and gentlemen, that when the tablet is empty, then it gets covered with unbelievable amounts of graffiti and posters for car boot sales. So we see how in a godless world, or at least a world without spirituality or a sense of the catastrophes that must be ameliorated in existence, so many towering trivialities pour in. I had death threats for that statue. They said that David Hume would never have worn a toga, as though I'd made some sort of mistake. You know, as though there was a statue of Cicero kicking about somewhere with a shell suit on. I just got them mixed up. It had been a packed week, you know. <laughs> it started my life as a sculptor, and I thought I'd never work in Edinburgh again. But then, latterly, I did manage to get a statue made, and there's now four of my works in Edinburgh. And this is of the great scientist James Clark Maxwell. The peoples of the book, the ancient Hebrews, the Mohammedans, Muslims, sorry, uh, I use te <laughs> archaic terms, I'm sorry, misspent childhood. Uh, the modernists, of course, peoples of the book, there are Scots Presbyterians, and then there are the scientists. Scientists don't like a picture. They much prefer a diagram. And if they've got to have a diagram, they would actually much prefer over that an equation. Far, far away from the percept, nearer and nearer to the concept. So that when the scientists of Scotland commissioned this work from me, many of them took great exception. Why, you know the way they all speak, why don't you just put up a great big black granite block with the beautiful equations inscribed upon it? As though to put up an image, an image of their hero would be some sort of crime against what had come down from the mountain, what had come down, what nature requires. It's a lack of empathy, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a lack of a desire to stop. I'm coming now to the end of my show. This is an inflammatory slide, but bear with me. We're in an academic context here. Moses is attractive because he is a forward driver, an impetuous mover forward towards, towards a future bliss. The conservative philosopher uh, Michael Oakeshott listed what it was that a conservative loved. And he said a conservative loves the same as opposed to the different, the near as opposed to the far. He wants the old as opposed to the new, and he would rather have present laughter over future bliss. In the, in the quest for future bliss, ladies and gentlemen, the camps of the last century were overflowing. I would rather have present laughter and future laughter. And you can see how this has been so compelling in so many different ways. So this kind of image is an absolute central thread through the whole of modern culture. Except when Torvaldsen comes along and brings the world to a halt. Next slide. I've got very little to do for Edinburgh now. This is this very early drawing for a statue of the architect Robert Adam. The great Scottish architect Robert Adam. Scott old British architect. And that will maybe be done in the next decade, and then I'll leave the city alone. And currently I'm working on a statue of Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and this is a very early, tiny but settle for the work. Jesus, even more stationary, seated on a famed klismos. You all know what a klismos is, that famous Greek chair. You have to remember that Jesus himself, of course, was a carpenter, and there's no doubt in Hellenistic Judea that he may have made a chair. And you can see how this relaxed and completely peaceful object actually prefigures the final dramatic catastrophe because a great big horizontal beam is shown behind him in the form of the chair. His hands hang before that beam and his feet are crossed on the point of the base to prefigure, as Holman Hunt did in his time with Jesus stretching in the shadow seen against the rack of tools. What is to come? It's very hard, you see, for a strict neoclassicist like me to make images of torture and the grotesque. We do it subtly, as it were, behind the scenes, so that we're not guilty of indulgence in movement, drama and cruelty. And then, when we go, we started in the wilderness, ladies and gentlemen, and I just want to show you what our Scottish wilderness looks like. 
This is the peninsula of Morven. And there you see just up here the first of the, the, the sound of Mull, right in the middle there, that very, very distant track. That's a, a wee loch. And, and uh, I'm going to end my days, ladies and gentlemen, with something on the Rushmore line, a representation to be cut into this site here where the rocks are showing through, a great big sunken effigy of the hero Oscar, who's the son of Fingal, to be cut into the stone at 100 feet long, into the granite of the bedrock of, of Morven Peninsula, so that it too might join Mount Rushmore over in Cologne uh, when the rocks have melted with the sun. I've got some sketch models that have been kicking about for a decade now of the object. There, there's a man down there. And maybe, maybe the injunction in a work like this is, well, look upon these works, not mine necessarily, but these works, ye mighty and despair, for it's this kind of work that the modernists, the contemporists, the awful types, all call intimidating. What precisely is it in them that feels so frightened by a work like this? It's the will, ladies and gentlemen, the thing that pushes them forward, the drive, the quest, the imperative of perpetual motion. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Anybody wants to ask anything? Or, please. The question is asking, what is the difference, or the difference says, between Canova's Gipsotech in, in Posano and uh, Torvalds' Museum in Copenhagen? And the difference is really simple and fundamental, that Posano has been besmirched by the little jumped-up additionist, Scarpa. Scarpa means dirty old shoe, uh, apparently in Italian. And it's just as though poor old... Poor old Canova's Gipsotech, which isn't a, a great star building, it's not by an identifiable architect, I don't think, uh, it has got the star architecture stuck on the side of it. It's a horrible thing with windows in the corners, you know, so you can look out and enjoy the view. Uh, the, 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 the sculptures in there look terrible. Um, the, the, it's a very different thing. Canova, you see, gave his work to Posano, his hometown, because it's a small town without much uh, going for it, in a way. The quarrying industry was dying. And he built a tempio, a very beautiful neoclassical temple church. And so it's a gift of Canova, who was a multi-billionaire in his time. Torvalds' case, well, it was a more romantic imperative. The nation needed to make sure that its greatness was, was there. So he was commanded to come home. The state did it, set up Torvalds' museum for him. So the two things have a different quality about them. Uh, the architecture, of course, in Canova's case is Italianate, but in Bindisbold's case, it comes actually from another kind of source, actually still Italian but ancient, Pompeii. Pompeii is fundamental to the architecture of Bindisbold's great museum, the greatest museum in the world. And the other thing, of course, is that the Museum of Torvaldsen is also his mausoleum, because he's buried in the central courtyard, in a beautiful vault, which nobody can see. It's a grave, of course. The coffin lies down there, and the interior of it is lined with beautiful stucco paintings of fronds of flowers and palm trees. So that's a fundamental difference. Apart from Scarpa. We once went on an architectural tour with some modernists to see buildings by Scarpa in Florence. And everybody's looking at the ground. There's all these wonderful buildings, you see. And not in Florence, in Venice. They're all looking at the ground, all these modernists, you see. And, uh, and then they would come to a bin store you know, that had been designed by Carlos Scarpa. And they'd all look up and come to life and marvel at the way he'd solved these problems and then completely ignore all the other stuff. You know, San Savino, nothing. Unbelievable. Scarpa. Scarpatic. Next, next, yeah, sorry. Yes. It, it's important that it be studied... But once you know about it, don't speak about it too much. Because, it, you know, philosophy, it's seldom well written. You know, Kant's a terrible writer. Schopenhauer, on the other hand, is a beautiful writer. If only Schopenhauer had translated Hume as he wanted to, 
then we could translate Hume, uh, Schopenhauer's translation from German back into English, and it would be a better standard of English than Hume himself supplies. Also with insights, because he couldn't resist margin, marginalia. Um, but but uh, the study of philosophy is important, because you see, for us traditionalists, there's a perception that we're not sufficiently scholarly, that we just have a good intention. But we've got to be able to run rings around these pseudo-conceptualists who think they are philosophers. I mean, it's laughable. No serious philosophers are interested in anything they say. You know, I can sort with philosophers, and it's just a laughing stock, frankly. So we all should, in fact, bone up in these things and so that when anybody comes along, you can quote Parmenides' proof to them that motion is impossible and, and really seriously get Socratic on their back, you know? <laughs> so it's important that we try to smarten up and get a bit more whiplashy, you know what I mean? So that they come along and we nuke them. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yes. Well, the question is, who is it that's commissioned this, oh, it's not up on the screen, the big effigy that you see? And the question is asking if it's a human sacrifice. No, no, it represents the dead hero Oscar from Gallic, Gallic culture, who's the son of, grand, grandson of Fingal and the son of Ossian in that 18th century phenomenal uh, literary explosion called the Ossianic Poetry. It was a great thing that started the Romantic Revolution in Europe, and it came from Scotland. In the story, Oscar dies by treachery in Ireland, and his body is taken back to Morven in the Scottish mainland and buried there to the sound of a thousand harps. It's simply a representation of that. Nobody's commissioning it from me. I'm the client. <laughs> Welcome to my world. We, we have to raise £20 million to do this work, which, of course, is the cost of two cleaner's cupboards in the new Scottish Parliament building or six missile strikes in Libya. It's a lot of money. It's nothing, in fact, but it will outlive the species and give the Scots up in the Port Morven Peninsula something worthwhile to do for the next 20 years. I mean, I'll be doing it until my dying day, you understand if I ever lived that long. <laughs> oh, yes, again. Yes, OK, this is to do with material fetishism. And, uh, <laughs> no, 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 but no, but I mean, it does actually, a question, the, the question leads on to this very beautifully. And it's an extraordinarily important thing. Again, material fetishism. You see, when you make a, you look at the outstanding work by my colleague, that bust that sits out there of Lincoln. I mean, really pay attention to that piece of work, ladies and gentlemen. It's a superb essay. Not, it's not classical sculpture. It's heroic realist sculpture. It comes out of a very different tradition, a tradition that opposes classicism in many respects. What they're trying to do is make a realism now as against that idealism of Canova and Torvaldson. We must be very careful with the use of the word classical. It's a stupendous piece of work. Now, it, I mean, it really is worthy of St. Gordon's. It really, it's really fantastic. Now, the thing is, that work is made in clay first. And then the same work is made in plaster. And then the same work is made in wax. And then the same work is made in bronze. You see, to get from the clay, which is a, a, a provisional material, simply to get the shape, because it can be pushed anywhere, you have to go through so many other shapes, uh, materials, materials, always with the same shape. So then you start with the clay model, which is sacrificial. It's torn to pieces once the mold's taken off it. Then you make a plaster cast of it. Well, that's what I do, at least. And so now you have a permanent plaster cast. But it has to be covered. It wouldn't work in the outside world. And if some Coptic crowd come and want to destroy it, it hasn't got a chance, you see? So then, from plaster, you make a secondary mold, and from that mold, you make a wax copy. The wax copy, again, is a sacrificial material because it will be put into an investment, melted out, vaporised. And then finally into that void is poured the bronze, and the bronze is eternal. So you have four materials. The same image has gone through four materials of an extraordinarily different character. You think about it. You know, there's clay, which is quite one thing, and then there's plaster. They're two very different materials. And then from plaster, 
we go to wax. It's like chalk and cheese. And then from wax to bronze. You see, and wax to bronze. I mean, these, these materials are very different. And what has consistently been maintained right through that protein change, that transmigration, that metempsychosis, as we might call it, that transmigration is the soul of the object, which is the shape that survives each one of these. You see, the Hindus didn't get it altogether wrong. They believe that you have many lives in which you're embodied. This is why sculptors, particularly modelers, are particularly interested in metaphysics, because the shape is the metaphysical thing that carries on through these mighty temporal leaps and material leaps. Personally, in my last life, I was a cow. <laughs> and in my next one, I hope to be a worm. Oh, what peace, tranquility, do no harm to anybody. So that, the clay model, of course, is the verbatim account where all the art's done. The rest of it is simply reproductive to cope with the privations and the vicissitudes of fortune in this world of pain, suffering, and perpetual screaming. <laughs> it's great to have a backing group, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? One more. This is the last one, sorry. Yes, they're all refugees from the art schools. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I take them on. Um, at, when they're about 15, they do work experience from their schools. And the first thing I do with these kids is I teach them to weld because they're, they're infantilized at school. They shouldn't be at school, some of them, at the age of 15. They should be working for me. So the first thing they do is they weld. It takes a boy two hours to learn to weld. You see, it's a semi-skill. And, um, and then... It takes a girl an hour and a half to weld. She's not so frightened because you know how women can hold hot plates and stuff like that so much more easily. Uh, uh, and they're deadly neater and what, well, absolutely outstanding. So the girls really show the boys how to do it. And, and then they go back to school after their week working for me and they're back to, you know, dummy tits and sucking their thumbs and being, you know, and they've been told that they should be going and getting a degree. You know, a degree in what? Golf course management studies or, <laughs> or aromatherapy. It's terrible. I don't believe in degrees, actually. I mean, if I get an art school going, as in my declining years I might, one thing is absolutely certain that when you come out of that art school, you just don't come out with a degree. You come out with a folio of drawings. You don't need a piece of paper to say what you can do. Just as you see what I can do. So the trouble is they come out with degrees from art schools because they want to get a real job. But fortunately, there are a tremendous number of architects who are all saying, You've got to come and decorate our buildings. You see the subtle hint I'm dropping here, okay? And there'll be plenty of work for everybody. All the quarries will get back into production. So uh, I have assistants, and what happens is they go back to school, then they go to art school to get their stupid degree, uh, cutting a shopping trolley in half and putting in a tank of vomit. And then, <laughs> and then in the holidays, in the holidays they come home to the studio straight away on the bus, they phone me up and say, can I come into the studio tomorrow? Because they feel that for the whole of their term, their semester, they have been liars, not only to themselves, but to the dead. You know, the great ones that they admire, all in the cause of sucking up to a dreadful tutor who has no known skills. <laughs> well, why don't I just say what I mean? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.